Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this lecture. It's good to see that so many of you made it to this room, despite the stormy weather raging uh, outside. <laughs> and <there's laughs> This lecture is organized by SBE, Scope and Studium Generale. And the lecture will take about one hour, and then we have half an hour for Q&A. There is no break, and you are invited to join for a drink in the Ad Fundum after the lecture. And this drink is offered to you by the SBE faculty. And I will now give the floor to Professor Mark Peterson, who will introduce Mr. Hofstede. Professor Peterson is holder of the Geert Hofstede chair on cultural diversity. So I give the floor to him. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to introduce Gerhard Hofstede. Obviously, I don't need to introduce too much since apparently many of you know who he is. Let me suggest, though, that he was very important to me during this past week. Uh, after visiting him and his wife in, in Velp last weekend, I spent a week in uh, Moscow. I don't know Russia well, so I was faced with a problem. How do I survive and adapt during the business trip I had there? I had a couple of conferences to speak at. The uh, original introduction to people in Moscow came from a PhD workshop that Professor Hofstede and I and Mikhail Sondergaard and uh, Michel Minkov and Professor Hofstede's son uh, often do. This time we did it in Istanbul. And a woman had come from uh, Moscow to be part of that seminar. She was my introduction to Russia. Now, when I go into a new country through her introduction in this case, I have to deal with a complicated problem, just like you do when you deal with different countries. Countries have very different governments. They have very different religious orientations and backgrounds different child raising practices, different courtship practices, which are of course important to the majority of you all right now, different work practices, which may become more important, and different understandings about people. So how do I sort out, give some order to that myriad of differences? Well, that's what Professor Hofstede suggested when identifying a number of cultural differences. Dimensions of cultural values help to summarize and provide some kind of comprehensibility to what otherwise would be a buzzing confusion of meaningless things. In, in this particular case, uh, one characteristic was that I needed to be attentive to was that Russia is a large power distance country. That means that less powerful people are accustomed to deferring to more powerful people. And I'll tell you in a minute how that uh, played itself out. In addition, though, to knowing culture dimensions like power distance, it's also very consistent with Professor Hofstede's way of thinking that one needs to always learn more and more and more and more details and specifics. You can't survive in a country just knowing culture dimensions. There's too much more. That's very much consistent with his thinking. In the situation of a large power distance uh, country, my original introduction through our friend Natalia turned out to give way to power distance issues. Before too long, I found that I wasn't dealing with Natalia, but somebody who had a little bit more power than Natalia, Emil, became my main contact. I corresponded for quite some time with Emil until I arrived and found that by the time I got to Russia, I was dealing with Sergei. Now, Sergei is about as high as you can get within academe. That means he reported to the president, not just of one university, but to a 60 university system. So Sergei was a person that I was trying to deal with on the last day before I left. 
Is he going to be gobbled up by one more person that I have to report to the next time? I don't know. But this is a large power distance situation. I've been involved in other large power distance situations which showed up in different specific ways. That is, I have to learn about Russia. So it has been very helpful to get a sense of Russia, many other things I could tell you about. But this is what you need to do in thinking about his work. How can his work give you an orientation to the world societies, just like north, south, east, and west does on a map? It doesn't tell you everything, but it sure is helpful to know that if you get on an airplane and you fly north, you're likely to need a heavier coat. And the precipitation isn't going to show up as rain, but as snow. Yeah, but it doesn't tell you what kind of coat to buy, and there's a lot more to learn. So with that introduction to what Professor Hofstede does and how he thinks and how his work should be helpful to you, let me provide you, turn this over to Professor Hofstede himself. Thank you very much. Good evening. I've never seen his room so full. Um, well, uh, my first quote here is from China. It is from 500 BC. Good government consists in being sparing with resources. I think that it is still a statement that never would be made in the United States after 2,500 years. So there is a difference in how people look at these things. Uh, although I would make the point that probably very few people would uh, not recognize that it's the responsibility of governments for letting future generations inherit a sustainable economy. Business is a different story, and there are certainly a lot of businesses that doesn't, don't recognize it or even deny it. And I would say that if we have a globalizing economy, then sustainability it demands the commitment of business. Now, I want to tell you about an adventure I had about business goals around the world. And first of all, what are business goals? They don't really exist. Only people have goals. So it is actually the goals of business leaders we're talking about. And uh, the actual goals, the goals in use. But if, how do you find out? If you ask the leaders, what you get is, well, nice stories. Um, window dressing. And also, there is another psychological effect. Uh, what are my goals? I think you better ask my wife, for example, if you want to know that, or my friends, or my, my, my sons, than myself. You, you're not aware of it yourself. But I have a, an experience which happened spontaneously. And this is in 1995. I retired from this university in 1993, when I was 65. And... Um, in uh, 1995, I was a visiting professor in Hong Kong, and I was teaching evening MBA students, people who were coming to the university two evenings a week and Saturday morning or three evenings a week. And um, they worked during the day for Hong Kong companies. And we started a discussion, more or less by accident, about uh, what are the goals of the business tycoons of Hong Kong they worked for. Uh, Li ka Stanley Ho, names like that. And um, we got a nice list made together by the class and myself, of 15 goals. And uh, two years later, there was an academic conference, three years later, and uh, I talked about uh, business goals that I showed my list. And um, after the, my talk, uh, I got all kinds of questions from colleagues who said, this is a nice list, can we use it? We also have part-time MBAs, we want to try it in our country as well. And without having organized it at all, I got data from 16 different countries, actually from two, 22 different universities, and um, uh, with the same thing. And then, Afterwards, much afterwards, I realized 
that just by accident I got probably the best, most honest uh, rating of the goals of business leaders available because the people who are working for work for these companies, they, are, they will certainly be aware of the goals and use of their leaders. And they're also accustomed to the jargon, so they know what the words mean. So by accident, this is probably the best results you could get. And here's my list. These are the 15 goals. So partly they came from the suggestions of the Hong Kong Chinese students. Partly they came from my suggestions. <laughs> And um, I divided them, they, this is the order in which they were rated by, this is the average of the 17 countries, they're averaged across the countries. And in, all in total there were 1900 MBA students involved. <laughs> now the top are growth, what I call business and ego results, the growth of the business, the continuity of the business, this year's profit, and then the egos, personal wealth and power. And then the middle group is what you could say the social role of business, honor, face, reputation. Face is of course what you call it in China. Reputation is probably what you call it here. Honor is what you call it in Latin countries. And creating something new, innovation, profits 10 years from now, staying within the law and responsibility towards employees. And then on the bottom is what I call special interest, respecting ethical norms, responsibility towards society, game and gambling spirit, patriotism, national pride, and family interest. Now, um, the rankings differ considerably between countries. This was the average, but this is the correlation between those averages and the scores of the individual countries. And um, if you are good at mathematics, you should realize that the the mean of those 17 rank correlations should be zero because they are rank correlations with the average of the whole of it. So you see the two extremes are most like the average of all is the USA and least like are China and Germany. And then there are others that are more like and others least like. The Netherlands is somewhere in the middle actually is uncorrelated with the overall mean. Now, this is the comparison with the two extremes. This is uh, the USA and it is Germany. And uh, uh, so let's have a look now at uh, what we find here. First of all, I use the script. I use the bold script for the five international top. And you see that the USA, and also, I must say, I, the way I in, divided this, I took the top five and the bottom five, I left the middle five out because they don't contain much news. So you see that in the USA, uh, the four of the five top uh, goals were even more important, except continuity. The one thing that was not important at all compared to other was continuity of the business. Um, then uh, if you uh, look at the Germany, then you see that four of the five tops, they were all on the bottom there. They were less important than in other countries. Uh, and the one which is not mentioned as continuity must be somewhere in the middle. Now I use the underlining if I find the same goal in two countries, and the, the only one I find is respecting ethical norms. Now that was actually the goal I liked least because it doesn't mean anything. Because one, one person's ethics may be something else. What, what does ethics mean? That you don't steal, or uh, that you work hard, um, or that you treat people nicely? And so ethics depends itself on culture. Um, so, uh, that doesn't tell me very much, uh, but, but look at the, the asterisks. The asterisks are where one country puts something at the top and the other country puts something at the bottom. Now, remember, I took the two countries which were the most different, Germany and the United States. And uh, actually, here are these, uh, these four from the top, 
with asterisk marked, but there are some, also some uh, remarkable differences. For example, profits 10 years from now is on the bottom in the United States. It's on the top five in Germany. Uh, by the way, when I say bottom five, top five, it is also compared to the overall mean. It is not the absolute ranking, it is a relative ranking to the overall mean. Um, responsibility as employees, low here, high here. Creating something new. It wasn't the USA the country of innovation. Um, uh, well, um, the one thing I know is that it's the only country that still pays me in checks. Um, well, um, so there are, it's, it's quite, a, quite a different picture. But let's go a little bit further. Let's see what is special about the U.S. business schools. Uh, first of all, you saw that from the 17 countries, the USA came closest to the average ranking. Um, ranking by MBAs, people working in business. And uh, you could say, okay, MBA programs were invented in the United States, so it's no wonder that they were uh, followed, that was followed. Uh, but if you look at the content, then you see you get a system with growth without continuity. You get wealth, personal wealth, very important, which means greed. You will, this year's profit is important, but long-term profit is not. This fits, by the way, with this growth for continuity. And there is little responsibility for the employees, and there is little creative innovation. Well, that was visible around the year 2000. And uh, I must say that I didn't see, and very few people at that time saw, that the business goals, which were visible also to the outside world, were an explosive mix which would lead to the financial crash. Nowadays, lots of books appear, also in the United States, that explain exactly this, that says, well, we could have known it in the year 2000. Um, but I myself wrote a, an article together with a few American colleagues in 2002 where we didn't see it. Actually, what we did is we looked at this matrix of uh, rankings and countries, but we grouped it by countries. And we didn't group it by, by goals. That's what I did afterwards. So, um, but let's see now what happened when we looked at the goals. First of all, uh, let's see how the US goals were uh, available, were the, uh, also visible in the countries. And then when you look at this, you see that actually the European countries in here, uh, Germany, Netherlands, France, and Denmark, they tend to be on the uh, non-US goals. They are different from the ranking in the United States. And most like USA are New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, uh, and so on. This is the middle group that not much to be said about. Um, now, I have, comparing a few countries, I'm comparing China and India, very important countries at the present time. And there is a remarkable similarity between those two. Actually, um, there is only one asterisk, and this is this notorious respecting ethical norms. And this is interesting. It shows the impact of, of history, because ethical norms in China means Confucianism. And uh, ethical norms here, this is India. Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism is a religion of or rituals where ethics as such is not spelled out. So this is a reversal. But for the rest, it's very similar. Both the patriotism, both are power. power. Uh, although families are very important, I think family interests are so obvious that they are not specifically spelled out. They're natural. Uh, well, the game is not, it's probably there, but it's not spelled out. Uh, the law is not so important because the powerful are more powerful than the law. 
And this year's profit is also less important. It, here in India, it's expensive on the top, and here it must be somewhere in the middle. Now let's take a few more European countries. This is the UK and Denmark, um, where you see that um, there are some differences. Uh, the, the asterisks are all that is most interesting. Um, that the UK is responsible, oh, sorry, the UK is responsible to our society. Um, continuity is important here, and somehow it seem, doesn't seem to be so important in Denmark. I don't understand that, but uh, of course there are things you don't understand. Um, and, but the creating something new is not so much something for the U UK, but it's on top in Denmark. So, um, staying within the law is important in both. <laughs> Responsibility towards employees. These are countries with a very old labor movement where the responsible towards employees has always been part of the business. Um, okay, no, the next one is France and the Netherlands. And those are the ones I will show. Um, again, there are similarities here. Um, in both give, that, uh, give in uh, to the idea of game in the business. Uh, both stress the continuity. Both stress the responsibility to those employees. France is the only country about where that should family interest uh, quite high. France is a company with a lot of family companies still, but they are not obvious. So they are uh, stressed as being a, a specific... Uh, element there. Patriotism is not strong in either. Um, reputation, to my surprise, is I thought that honor, which would, would be uh, important in France, but it's obviously not important in terms of business goals. Reputation is very important in the Netherlands. Okay, you can study this afterwards if you want. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting literature in itself. This happens also, therefore, when you look at the goals itself, their content. So, um, why are the goals so different from one country to another? Uh, because, of course, the national culture is different. Here I come on my favorite subject. And um, the idea about national culture differences is that um, they relate to the basic problems countries, societies face. And that all countries in the world, that's an old idea from anthropology, they share the same basic problems, but each national society has its own answers. And uh, most of you will know, will know at least four of these, um, but uh, in the meantime, I have six. Inequality, how much inequality, how afraid are we of the unknown, people, ideas, and object. How dependent are we on our people around us, mainly our family. Um, how should a man feel, how should a woman feel? What does it mean to be born as a girl or as a boy? Do we focus on the future, on the present, or on the past? And the last one, recently added, are we allowed to have fun, or is life a serious matter? And these are six different dimensions of national cultures, and this is their official name. It's, uh, you know, certainly, probably know the first four. It is power distance, and Mark Peterson was talking about it already. It is uncertainty avoidance, uh, which means dealing with the unknown. It is dependence on close others. So it is from individual to collectivism. Um, it is emotional gender roles. It is whether the genders are supposed to have different emotions or whether they're supposed to have similar emotions. Uh, the time perspective from long term to short term. And finally, the most recent one, the, the fun versus the, uh, uh, the, the, for the serious matter is from indulgence to restraint. Uh, let me say a few things about power distance, and that was the topic which also gu guided Mark in, uh, in, in Russia. Interesting thing about power distance is that if you want to find out power distance, you should look at the people at the bottom. 
and not at the people at the top. There are always people at the top who want to take power, but they get as much power as the people at the bottom want to give them. And um, so it is the less powerful in the society uh, who say that. This, by the way, this statement was made already in the 16th century by a French, young French author, Etienne de la Boissy, um, who talked about the, uh, uh, the, voluntary, the voluntary subjection of the subordinate. And uh, this is the, uh, something which we haven't got in us by in our genes. It is actually transferred in the family situation between the parents and the children. Um, now let's look at the power distance here. Uh, this is the results of the business goal study. Where, uh, which more or less followed the ranking in power distance, which I found in completely different sources elsewhere. Not exactly the same, but there is a strongly significant correlation. And uh, France is a country uh, where le pouvoir is very important. Um, and uh, New Zealand, for example, is a country where equality is quite important. Uh, Britain is also a country where equality is at least theoretically, is in important. Denmark is certainly an equal country, uh, and they are still on the, on the equal side. Uh, India and China are on the side of the large power distance, which we already saw in their goals. Um, now, there is also a side to um, a cultural power distance, because it also helps to explain how people tend to organize what they consider an organization. And then you need also this uncertainty avoidance side, which is the extent to which the members of the culture, oh, sorry, the members of the culture feel threatened by unknown and ambiguous situation. And this is not uh, risk avoidance. This is a misunderstanding which people often make, but it is not risk is to uncertainty as fear is to anxiety. Risk and fear are focused. They have an object. Uncertainty and anxiety have no object. They are diffused. Anything may happen. It's, it's an, actually, it's a matter of, uh, you could say, uh, societal neuroticism is, is one way of expressing the uh, uncertainty avoided in a society. And if you combine those two, you, uh, this is a, a, a listing of, a basic listing of countries with the power distance being small, let me see where yeah, that is, small or large, and uncertainty avoidance being weak or strong. Now, if you have both low, small, then you get the Nordic countries, you get the Anglo countries, you get also the Netherlands, then an organization is a place where the things are not decided by power and not decided by rules, but basically decided by negotiation. In Holland, we call that poldering. But uh, in uh, other countries, they do it in a different way. And uh, uh, so that is the implicit, mark, um, uh, implicit model in people's mind. If you look the opposite corner, where the power distance is large and the uncertainty of what it is strong, then everything is determined by the power and the, and the rules. So you get a kind of a pyramid of people, and on top there is just one person, the président directeur général, and uh, there below is the, uh, the people and according to the place where they should be. And uh, the interesting thing is that you find some Asian countries here, but here, the combination of large power distance and weak uncertainty about it, you get China and India. And then you get a model, which I call the model of the family, uh, big family is a place where it is evident who is the boss. The boss is, is the, the father or the grandfather or what it is. Uh, but uh, the rules are much less clear. The rules they can be adapted to the situation. And uh, of course there are a lot of family companies in both in China and in India. But uh, so that is also one, but also the way they looked at it. If you look, for example, 
at the theories of Confucius, you see that he compares society altogether to a family. And then the last one is the machine corner, which is the German-speaking countries. The Baltic states turn out, they were once a time organized by Germans, by the way, and Hungary, which belonged to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and they have typically a machine model where the power distance is small, but the uncertainty of audience is, is uh, large. It means that actually the rules settle everything. And the role of management is not so important. And this determines what kind of an organization then is, is given. But it doesn't say anything yet about the goals of that organization. Um, okay, this is power distance. Uncertainty avoidance. I go to the long term, short term. And this is what it stands for. And... Um, Long-term orientation stands for rewards in the future, perseverance, thrift, adaptation to changing conditions. Uh, for example, if you take China, um, you have, uh, for a given moment in the 60s, when the population grew too fast, they made, established the one-child policy. Now that it is more or less stopped, they are in process of withdrawing it but that adaptation is possible, and the interesting thing is that uh, a sufficient number of people actually follow it, so it works. Short-term orientation, and this is new insights which we also get because we got new data. There is an element in there of what you call self-enhancement. Short-term orientation means actually national pride. It means that we cannot learn anything from anybody else. Um, we are uh, special, uh, but also tradition, and in some cultures, like the Islamic traditions, uh, the uh, traditions are very old, and they determine why we have the truth and nobody else can teach us anything. And there also there is a need for immediate rewards, and the, uh, actually the most typical uh, expression of immediate rewards is to publish them with quarterly results. I have always give, considered this complete nonsense. It has become customary in business that anybody who has ever been responsible for a business knows that results are not made quarterly. And that to publish quarterly results means that you have to, to, to jumble with the figures and so that it gets them, make them fit more or less quarterly results. Uh, it, is, it doesn't tell you anything. It is only a way of getting the uh, stock prices up and down. Uh, okay, this dimension was originally based on the Chinese value survey. It did not come out of my original set of a database collected by IBM. Uh, but later on, uh, my colleague Minkov discovered that also in the World Value Survey, you can find scores from which you can derive this. It is very much correlated with the other one. So these are the new scores and they are based, based on data from uh, much more recently. Uh, and this is uh, here. Uh, you see in the data from the business goals that uh, when this year is more important than 10 years is less important, they, they are each other's opposite. And you see that there are short-term oriented countries, and this covers fairly closely, but not exactly, the data of the short-term, long-term we had. Uh, anyway, uh, you see that uh, China, India, and the Asians in Hawaii, all the Asians, they are on the 10 years side, I think 10 years is very important. So is our Denmark and Germany. Uh, the Netherlands is a bit in the middle, and uh, actually the USA is not the shortest term in this respect. Uh, Brazil and Great Britain uh, are even more, are shorter. I was talking in the beginning, I was starting beginning my talk with talking about sustainability, and what, which of the business goals is related to sustainability? But I would say that the responsibility towards society is actually a 
implies actually concern for sustainability. And, um, and it comes out of the, of the factor analysis of the various goals that when you have more growth, you have less uh, importance of society. So those two, they are each other's opposite. So I can put them as each other's opposite here, and there are the growth-oriented countries, uh, which is Australia and uh, uh, it's Australia, it's, it's USA, uh, and, uh, and then the, here is the society-oriented countries, and there is uh, actually uh, the European countries here, uh, but China and India and France are also more on this side. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there is uh, actually, if we, if we want to go for society, uh, for sustainability, then I think we have to build more on these type, this type of cultures. Um, and there is the last one, which is at the point of greed. Uh, greed was also in the title of my speech. And uh, greed is that wealth is important. It turns out in the factor analysis that wealth uh, opposes the uh, concern for employees. And uh, now you get a very interesting uh, distinction here because it opposes what I call colonial societies to what I call civil societies. These are all countries that were originally uh, occupied by settlers who came there to get rich, to make a fortune. They, they migrated there to make a fortune. Um, these were old countries that tried to organize their society in a way that it would become uh, a good society to live in for everybody. And this is what they call civil societies. And the European countries, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Britain, France, they're all in there, and so are China and India. Okay, I, this gives a kind of insight into the differences you can find from this spontaneous uh, piece of research. Let me make some suggestions. And uh, so if we have to design a new economic world order, how should it be? Well, first of all, um, it is important that we have no more superpower. We had a superpower for a time, and whoever has the power influences the values, and then it was more or less determined also what would be the super values. But in the new economics, cultural value systems have become a variable. It depends on whose value systems do we take. Do we take American values? Do we take German values? Uh, if you have the discussion, uh, the, not about the uh, uh, scanning, but uh, discussion about goals between Angela Merkel and Obama, there it, it is fully. Um, uh, do we have to resolve the crisis by spending or by saving? Um, and um, the, it also means that if we get global business, we need uh, leaders who understand and respect local values. So I come to a suggestion on business goals, at least for Europe in the 21st century, where uh, I try to build on the kind of things that are already visit, uh, are visible, sorry, already visible in the uh, uh, data I showed. And uh, so stress on social responsibility, less stress on personal wealth, uh, stress on continuity, uh, less stress on growth. Growth is a, growth is a mixed blessing. I mean, uh, growth is often a, uh, an easy solution out of a problem, but anything that, nothing can grow forever. In, in medicine, certainly things that grow forever are called cancers. And uh, uh, it, is, it is not a permanent solution. It, it should be uh, put against its disadvantages. There is a sustainability versus the exploiting of resources. There is the long-term profit versus the short-term profit. There is the respect of local values versus the global arrogance, which is we know what's good for everybody. And um, 
there is the innovation, which also was a striking difference between countries, the extent to which managers were seen as innovating, uh, either innovation or the uh, goals of more of the same. And this is a, my one-liner of the day for those of you who do an MBA. Masters of Business Administration, fine, but they should have learned to be servants of society. Uh, we have to realize that the American era is over. Probably among the people here, because of my age, I am the only person who remembers that it began. <laughs> because actually, uh, when, when I was young, the, uh, the kind of things we studied in economics, they didn't come from America, they came from Europe. And uh, at the given moment, it all went over to, uh, to America. But that nothing lasts forever, though this is also over. Uh, I hope to have shown that there are contributions from other parts of the world, very important, from India, from China, from, from Europe. And uh, that uh, academia cannot collect its wisdom only in America, uh, as the, uh, all the American uh, jour journals more or less uh, suggest. It should collect its wisdom worldwide. It's not yet easy. It's considerably more difficult to get your articles published if you are not from America. But this is actually also something for the programs of the universities. And the last one is a remark for the Dutch business um, to become very practical. Um, Holland, and I had a few weeks ago at the same talk for an audience in Denmark, uh, small countries like ours, they, uh, if they want to become global players, they're almost condemned to sell out to larger global players because they're always the smallest. And um, there is a risk involved. And um, uh, in Holland, I think one of the sad examples we have, uh, which are, to me is, is the most painful event of the past decade, is the selling out of Organon uh, to an American, um, this, uh, the, the, the Dutch pharmaceutical laboratory, the star laboratory of the country, but to sell in 2007, uh, Organon was sold to an American partner, a majority, for I think 11 million, milliard, I use the milliard, which the Americans call a billion, a billiard, uh, uh, Euro, and uh, that is uh, was supposed to be to be wonderful, but what they didn't realize is to whom did you sell it? What were the cultural business goals of the new owners? And within three years afterwards, the uh, the uh, American owners, who in the meantime had been merged among themselves and become my American Sharp and Dome, they sold the uh, they closed the whole lab, and. Uh, Holland lost its best pharmaceutical lab. And 1,200 jobs got lost. And this only for a temporary ID that selling for 11 milliard euro would be a good ID. Uh, actually, the damage done is much larger than that. Um, so how long was the time subjective of these owners? And what if we sell off, what could it mean for the present stakeholders, employees, customers, local society? We now have Mr. Slim. And uh, is, uh, actually, Mr. Slim has not yet been able to, is not, not slim enough to, uh, uh, <laughs> to, to sell, to buy the Dutch KPN. And uh, I'm very happy about that. And uh, I hope that they have become a little bit wiser and put some protection in there. Um, but uh, this is a dilemma for uh, going international if you are in the Dutch business. And uh, uh, don't believe all those, don't also believe the international press. Um, 
because authors and journalists are children of their culture, and culture includes what is good and what is evil. And uh, what is it? Is it good to sell for 11 milliard uh, euro, or is it is it evil when 1,200 people lose their jobs? Um, uh, then also uh, people come with predictions. Yes, but as we don't do this, then there will, be, there will only be three players in five years' time and we will not be one of them. Well, those predictions depend on what you put in them. And then there is the, the craze about ranking lists, uh, also very popular among universities. And um, uh, so uh, we want to be on the top 100 and so... And, um, well, what does it mean? What does it really mean? What does it mean for the people who work there? And you can get your, any results in a ranking by just putting in the index you select. So it depends on where you want to go. Okay, this was the end of my message. Just uh, my sources, uh, if you want to read it, uh, it, most of it appeared in an article in Asia Pacific Business Review, you will understand that it is easier to get this message published in Asia than in the United States. Um, this is, by the way, this book is published in the United States and, uh, uh, and it's, they have the experience now that it, that it does sell well and I have a, a very helpful publisher there. Um, so, uh, it, this is the reference in the book itself. This book, by the way, is available in its last editions and also in earlier editions on uh, 20 languages and you can see it there. Uh, among others, it is published in Chinese, in Japanese, in Korean and soon in Vietnamese. So it is very popular also in Asia. Well, this is what I wanted to say. How have I been doing for time? Uh, well, okay, well, I think we have some time for discussion. Uh, yes?